Good afternoon, and welcome to the Akron Roundtable. I'm Angelina Milo, Board Chair and President of the Akron Roundtable Board of Directors. Today's program will be rebroadcast on Thursday, May 27th at 8 p.m. on WKSU 89.7 FM. We're delighted that so many of you are able to join us today for this virtual pro program, and it is our privilege today to welcome to the roundtable stage Dr. Gary Miller, President of the University of Akron. His topic is post-pandemic urban higher education, the new meaning of place. We sincerely thank the Akron Summit County Public Library for continuing to host our virtual events. We are also thankful for the generous support Akron Roundtable receives from sponsors, patrons, and subscribers. Today's program is generously sponsored by the Knight Foundation. Please visit our website at akronroundtable.org if you'd like to make a contribution. On our website, you will also find a list of our board members and our staff. I'd like to take a moment and thank our staff and our board members for the very hard work. I'm very fortunate to serve alongside such an outstanding group of community leaders dedicated to the Roundtable mission. Please mark your calendars now for our next event, Thursday, June 17th, when we will host Rachel Cargill, public <coughs> academic writer and philanthropic innovator. You can read more about our upcoming speakers by going to our website. Also, on our podcast page of our website, you can listen to our roundtable programs. We are grateful to the University of Akron and the Excel Center for Experiential Learning for sponsoring our podcast series. Again, our website address is akronroundtable.org. Today's speaker, President Gary Miller, will be introduced by fellow Akron Roundtable board member, Christine Curry. CEO of OpenM. Following his presentation, Dr. Miller has generously agreed to take questions from our audience. Christine will also coordinate that portion of the program. To facilitate your questions, we'll be using Asker technology. Asker technology enables you to submit questions via mobile devices. Questions may be submitted at any time during the program and will be forwarded for review during our Q&A portion. Watch the screen should you need instructions. For those of you on social media, please follow us at Akron Roundtable on Facebook and Twitter, and use the hashtag Akron Roundtable to continue the conversation. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Christine Curry. Thank you. Thanks, Angelina. Gary L. Miller was appointed by the University of Akron Board of Trustees on August 14th, 2019, to serve as the 18th president of the university. His tenure began October 1st, 2019. Dr. Miller has served as an institutional leader and consensus builder at public universities in several regions of the country. In addition to more than two decades of senior higher education leadership, Dr. Miller also has firsthand experience as a researcher and teacher. President Miller will explore with us today the vast changes in how urban research universities like the University of Akron are confronting past assumptions, reevaluating strategy and mission, and thinking about what campus and city mean for the future. His remarks will include a preview of new approaches and new expectations at UA. Dr. Miller. Thank you, Christine, and thank you for that kind introduction and the invitation to uh, be here today. It's, a, it's indeed a great honor and a great opportunity for me to have time to provide you some of my thoughts about the future of American higher education in general and the University of Akron in particular. On March 4th, 2020, I attended the Ohio birthday celebration in Washington, D.C., where a couple hundred of us crowded into a room in the Library of Congress. A few days later, Senator Sherrod Brown was the guest speaker at this event, the Akron Roundtable. Early the following week, I suspended classes for two weeks and announced that we would come back after spring break in a full online mode with a vastly reduced campus footprint. 
And we've been in that format since then, two and a half semesters and a summer term. Like every other college and university president in the country, nearly everything I thought about higher, the future of higher education came under question in March of 2020. When confronted with the rapid spread of a global disease, we were suddenly faced with an unprecedented pedag pedagogical, financial, and health crisis. My leadership team, the university faculty and staff, the board of trustees, student government, have worked together with uncommon courage and creativity since that time to stabilize the university and ensure that we continue to deliver the excellent programs for which we're known. The urgency of our work during this time was fueled primarily by the facts on the ground, which changed daily and sometimes several times a day. And much of our work focused on health and safety issues and providing support for students who were caught in the throes of the pandemic. Nevertheless, we accomplished quite a bit. Without cutting any degree programs, we reorganized the university from 11 colleges to five. We reduced the size of our faculty, our administration, and our athletics program. We reshaped our strategic vision, changed our enrollment approach, and recently made a number of moves to make the University of Akron experience more affordable for those in the region. We negotiated new labor agreements with our faculty and staff unions that recognized the financial realities of our time. And we continue to revise our approach to nearly everything we do and are, and are doing so sometimes at a dizzying tempo. Many of you listening today joined us on periodic briefings during that time and we deeply appreciate your support. However, despite the urgency and intensity of our efforts, there has never been a time since March 2020 when we have not also thought about what comes next. What does the post-pandemic future of American higher education look like? And what is the University of Akron's place in that future? And it's that future that I wanna spend my time with you today talking about. As the title of my talk suggests, I believe the future of the University of Akron and perhaps all of public higher education will depend in large measure on how we reimagine what it means to be a campus in a time of great change, particularly technological change. It's important to understand, however, that the crisis of campus, if you will, is not solely the result of the COVID pandemic. Indeed, the enterprise of public higher education in America has struggled under strong forces of change for decades. We arrived at this pandemic already dealing with, and in some cases weakened, by changes in demography, uh, continuing declines in state support, increasing demands for specific talent needs, and of course, the breathtaking pace of technological change, which I'll come back to shortly. The pandemic did not so much introduce a vast new set of difficulties to higher education as it added to a suite of already existing existential threats. To understand what we face today and tomorrow, we need to appreciate what we faced the day before I closed this university down. The set of transitional forces against higher education is complex, but I think there are two that are very important for my comments today that I wanna mention. The first of these is the change in the perception of the value of higher education. And the University of Akron is an excellent example of some of the features of this transition. During the time that the University of Akron was a municipal university, and after that, when it became a public university in Ohio, there was a very, very strong feeling among Akron citizens, and indeed within America, that it was a good thing to have a university in your city. That feeling exists in Akron today, and it's, as I'll show, is a great advantage to us. This same attitude existed throughout America uh, in the latter part of the 20th century and it fueled the great expansion of higher education in America in the 1960s, the time when UA trans, uh, transitioned into a public state university. During this great expansion, towns all across the country fought one another to get a university in their town. You can see the results of this if you look uh, at some states like Pennsylvania, New York, and Wisconsin, where there are lots of universities, some of them in very small towns. There were two drivers of this enthusiasm of higher education. P. 
people were beginning to understand the value of the college degree to a person's lifetime success. Today, the college degree is worth about $1.5 million in lifetime income premium. But there was something else. People all over the country believed there was a strong commonwealth value to having a college in your town. There was an appreciation that institutions like the University of Akron contributed significantly to a more vibrant and prosperous community. Universities attracted smart people who uh, often demanded better schools and responsive government. During this time, there was a general feeling that there was a significant social, cultural, and economic advantage to having a university in your town, even if you did not have a college degree. One of the biggest and most insidious transitions in higher education landscape since the 1960s is the loss of this Commonwealth value. Most people in the country today do not believe there is a Commonwealth value to higher education. If they believe in higher education, and increasingly many don't, they believe the value accrues primarily to the individual getting the degree. This help ex helps explain decades-long slide in state funding for higher education. The thinking goes, if the college degree primarily benefits the individual getting the degree, then why should the state pay for it? Unfortunately, this thinking is most often paired with the views that tuition is a tax that should be regulated and that if higher education benefits mainly the individual and not society as a whole, universities should be primarily in the job training business to help individuals get good careers. This change in our perception of the value of higher education sets up an important tension regarding what a public university like the University of Akron should be about. Increasingly, policymakers view regional institutions as mainly talent generators, rather than also as economic, social, and cultural assets to the community. And I'll return to this in my final argument. The second existential threat uh, facing higher education prior to the pandemic and now is, it, is this Gutenberg scale change in the dynamics of knowledge. Until relatively recently, the reason someone went to a university was because knowledge resided there in the form of books, the people who wrote those books, and taught about them. Universities now operate in a much, much different environment. Knowledge is ubiquitous and virtually universally accessible. The university professor no longer holds all the knowledge. Each day, about three to five billion Google searches are issued. Each one of these searches represents someone asking a question. Each of these searches accesses a virtually limitless universe of knowledge. This represents a massive global learning environment in which no university professor is involved. It's literally true in today's world that the biggest impediment to gaining useful knowledge is not access to it. Rather, it's a lack of developmental maturity, the lack of key skills at mining that knowledge, and perhaps most importantly, the lack of an understanding of how to value various sources of knowledge. What this means is that universities have to operate more as navigators and guides rather than as teachers. Learning happens all the time. Our job is to shape that learning. This new role raises two important questions. First, how does the university shape that knowledge for its students? And secondly, how do we place a monetary value on this new university role of guiding people through the digital knowledge world? The first question is the root of the tension between policymakers and universities about whether higher education has a progressive bias. The second question is the basis for the overheated public view that digital learning is the best learning, something that I'll come back to in a minute. So prior to the pandemic, universities were struggling to operate in a global knowledge economy characterized increasingly by an increasingly individualistic view of higher education. I believe these challenges to uh, and to, um, to meet these challenges and to emerge from COVID stronger for the future, 
we have to focus on one of the oldest concepts in the American Academy, the idea of the campus. And let me turn to that now. The concept of campus, the essential connection of time and space in the enterprise of learning, was a founding principle of the American Academy brought forward from university life of the Middle Ages. Uh, indeed, accounts of the medieval university's challenges with student behavior bear a striking familiarity with the difficulties of the contemporary university. Even during the Middle Ages, much of the enterprise was about managing unruly adolescent men. The rambunctious medieval undergraduate was perhaps only slightly less, uh, slightly more restrained than the intemperate young men of the early English universities, which were often referred to as penal institutions, by the way. What arose in colonial America and has continued in the American mind is this concept of the collegiate way of living. This is a term that was coined in 1702 by the Massachusetts scholar and Puritan divine Cotton Mather. The historian Samuel Elliott Morrison probably described this concept the best in a speech in 1936 commemorating the 100 year anniversary of Harvard College. And he said, and I'm quoting, to the English mind, university learning apart from college life was not worth having. It was only by studying and disputing, eating, drinking, playing, and praying as members of the same collegiate community in close and constant association with each other and with their tutors, the priceless gift of character could be imparted to young men." End quote. Thus, in establishing Harvard College, in the English traditions, the New England government planted the seeds of the complex ecosystem of interacting community, academics, learning, teaching, student life, and architectural design that we know as campus today. And while throughout the history of American higher education, we have accommodated emerging narratives of what campus is, think of things like learning communities, residence hall architecture, recreation centers, and athletics and the like, we generally do not question the underlying assumption of the need for physical connection and close personal interaction in the process of higher learning. We have always assumed that American universities are places. The pandemic revealed how important this idea is. As it became clear that the pandemic would disrupt regular campus activities, students were advised to take a gap year until things got back to normal. Many parents and advisors were so concerned that their student would lose out on the important part of the college experience, campus life, they advised them to wait. Indeed, our enrollment data now suggests prospective students are still waiting to see if their university of choice will continue in the digital format. Striking evidence of the desire to be connected was demonstrated by at a number of our highly residential sister institutions in Ohio. Like UA, these institutions moved to a digital format. Nevertheless, students descended onto these campuses anyway, arriving well before the beginning of classes, which were going to be digital, in order to get together with their friends. And, there, and you may remember there were many virus super spreader parties at that time. This thirst for campus was not restricted to traditionally residential colleges and universities. The most common complaint we heard from our students at UA about the digital format was the lack of personal interaction with faculty and staff. And most of our students are commuter students. So in the spring of 2020, the whole of American higher education moved from a digital format suddenly and nearly completely decoupling learning from campus. Suddenly the collegiate way of living, so ingrained in the American mind, was disrupted. This created great excitement in two groups of higher education critics. First, higher education futurists, who for quite some time have predicted the demise of the traditional college. And secondly, public policymakers, particularly those at the state level, who tend to be highly skeptical of the Commonwealth values of the university system, the futurists, 
Scott Galloway, a former uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneur now teaching at NYU and a longtime critic of traditional higher education, suggested the post-pandemic future will give elite universities like MIT, Stanford, and Harvard entree into retail higher education, which is what he would assume we are doing. He predicted these universities will develop thousands of online and hybrid degrees at a very affordable price, uh, eliminating most brick and mortar colleges. Galloway has long predicted the collapse of such uh, so-called second tier universities, he would include UA in that group, to be replaced by mega business education conglomerates uh, uh, around elite universities. Why? those of Galloway's ilk would ask, would you take an engineering degree from a regional research university like UA if you could get the same degree from the Harvard Microsoft conglomerate at the same price? Now to be sure, uh, we must be open to technological change and attuned to what we have discovered about how technology can be used and make learning more exciting and effective. Uh, others outside of higher education certainly are. Take, for example, the, uh, uh, the, biz, uh, the company Coursera, which is an online learning company that parents with 150 universities offers 4,000 certificates, courses, and entire degree programs in a digital format. During COVID, the company initiated the Workforce Recovery Initiative, where it offered many of these courses free to people who lost their jobs. The company also provided college students free access to many of these courses. So people are taking notice. For their part, as they watched major universities in their state move seemingly effortlessly to a digital format, many, many policymakers saw opportunities for public higher education, which represents the greatest portion of the discretionary budget in most states, to move more efficiently to a uh, to a more efficient talent development enterprise by extan expanding digital learning. The futurist dream of a do-it-yourself university and the policymakers' drive toward efficiency and talent production seem to work very strongly against the idea of a university as a place or a campus. But it's very important to note here that despite the resurgence of enthusiasm for a new dawn of digital higher education, the force of campus, of place, as an essential element of the enterprise is perhaps stronger than we think. Indeed, critics of the idea that a digital takeover of higher education is inevitable often ask, why hasn't that happened? While technology has expanded dramatically and evolved since the 1930s, there have been relatively few disruptive events in the use of technology and learning. The massive open online courses, the MOOCs of the early 2000s, never morphed into a global network of free education once dreamed of by the futurists. I believe because of this, as we move out of the pandemic, those of us fortunate enough to work in an urban university with a supportive city are being presented with an historic opportunity an opportunity to rebuild the lost commonwealth value of higher education. I believe our future can be more than an accommodation of efficiencies. And this brings me back to my working thesis, that we will somehow have to reconceive what it means for the University of Akron to be a campus, a place where learning and discovery takes place. Now, there are many approaches we could take to this challenge. We have a great deal going for us and in this important endeavor. We have one of the finest business colleges in the country, one of the uh, first undergraduate cybersecurity programs in America, world-class engineering, and particularly international reputation in polymer science, a great law school, a range of excellent undergraduate and graduate programs in this arts and sciences and health professions, an important graduate and master's uh, and doctoral programs programs. As we have in the past, we will continue to leverage these programs for opportunity, community engagement, and economic development. But there's another set of assets we have at the university that I believe we can better organize and deploy in partnership with the City of Akron and other partners to develop a national model 
for how a public research university and its legacy city work together to create a special place for education, work, and entrepreneurship. This is a set of assets that if deployed with imagination and in an organized way, offers us, in my view, the very best way to directly elevate those community university interactions that form the commonwealth value of an urban university. You know, things like celebrating stories and differences, lifting up service, and recognizing the power of learning in order to understand one another. These programs are our academic and outreach programs in the visual and performing arts, music, and literature. In February, I commissioned a group of faculty under the direction of Dr. Joe Ergo to consider how we might organize these programs, the related faculty research and scholarship, and relevant physical facilities into a partnership model for a city university driven campus development. The group has worked with uncommon energy and commitment and just this week released a compelling plan to synergize and deploy these great university resources in coordinated partnership with current university initiatives in downtown to enliven downtown life, attract residents, visitors, and businesses, increase enrollment, and importantly, merge the future campus concept with our emerging vision of downtown. This report is entitled Akron Arts, Reimagining University Arts Programs for Community Revitalization. And after this talk, it will be available on, on the President's webpage at uh, the university website. This new version of university engagement has several features. It's the first, it's designed to connect immediately to ongoing activities to revitalization of downtown Akron. The city of Akron and its partners are well along with a deep community consideration of the future of place. For some time, the city, Summit County, and their many partners have purposefully and creatively executed a program of revitalization and renewal of the city as a place. The activities of Downtown Akron Partnership, the Civic Commons Initiative supported by the Knight Foundation, the GAR Foundation, and, another, uh, and a number of other national foundations, major infrastructure improvements, the Akron Civic Theater restoration, and an increase in activities designed to draw people to work, live, and play in downtown have the potential uh, con to continue to make Akron a great place. An essential element to this focus is diversity and inclusion, which is key to any route to success in a diverse city like Akron. Many, many faculty and staff at the university participate in these initiatives and their commitment to the city and their willingness to provide time and talent to it are impressive and very, very appreciated. As an institution, however, the university has not, in my view, offered itself as a value-adding partner to these important activities. The Akron Art Initiative is designed to place the university in a leading role as an institutional partner in this important community work. Secondly, the Akron Arts Plan involves a revisioning of how we use our spaces in the downtown area, especially the Polsky Building, which fronts the Civic Com Commons area and Lock 3. The goal here is to design ways to physically deploy portions of our art and music programs into spaces closer to downtown, where community faculty student interactions can be nurtured and where community members can enjoy arts while living and visiting in the area. Third, all studies of city revitalization show the importance of having a vigorous art and music scene in the downtown space. An important focus of the Akron Arts Initiative is to connect the university with business and government in Akron to attract new enterprises to the city, encourage people to live downtown, make their downtown spaces attractive for business, recreation, and entertainment. Fourth, the Akron Arts Program envisions a new role for E.J. Thomas Performing Arts Hall. As a sustaining partner with the Akron Civic Theater to provide a greater volume and variety of programs for the Akron community and provide more opportunities for UA faculty and students. 
Now, finally, of course, our reimagination of place must integrate with what's going on downtown Akron, but it also must integrate with what we're doing on campus. We will accomplish this by focusing on our faculty and our students and the key partnerships we have in place. The Meyer School of Art, Visual Artist and Design Residency and Lecture Series, made possible by a generous gift from Mary Schiller Myers, will bring nationally and internationally recognized artists and scholars to campus and downtown. Our Northeast Ohio Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing is a regional consortium with Kent State, Cleveland State, and Youngstown State. And this will connect our campus with the city of Akron and other great legacy cities in our region. Integrating with that program will be the University of Akron Press, which is housed already downtown in Quaker Square. And our relationship with the National Center for Choreography at the University of Akron will be expanded to provide the community with even more exposure to dance through its extensive national and international connections. Important programs on campus, such as the coming Center for the History of Psychology and Synapse, the Art Plus Science series of our Biomimicry Research and Innovation Center, will connect art, music to the physical, biological, social science programs of the university to create community learning, entertainment opportunities on campus and downtown. And of course, we will reach out to our many alumni who have achieved great recognition in the arts to partner with us to bring their special talents back to Akron. To realize this vision will, of course, take time and lots of support. And today I'm asking for your questions and your expressions of interest in helping the university and the city move together out of this pandemic and into a new vision of what it means for a great urban research university and its city to create their place together. The way to begin is to review the Akron, Akron Arts Report, and, which is posted, and give us your feedback. I want to end my talk today with a short passage from the Akron Arts Report. The main author of this report is our colleague at the university and longtime chronicler of the history of Ohio and its people, David Giffels. This piece beautifully reminds us of the special relationship of this university and its city, but it also affirms my promise to you of our commitment to the future of this place. David writes, Akron's narrative is a long unspooling of invention and reinvention. The city and its university have known hard times and have always leaned on creativity in all its forms to meet and overcome our challenges. As we begin to reemerge from the long, dark hibernation of the pandemic, UA is eager to embrace its relationships across Akron to lead, support, share, and elevate art as a celebration of life. I I'm very appreciative of the invitation to be with you today. Georgia and I love this university and this city and this place, and we are very much looking forward to rising together with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We have a few questions from you, for you from our, our audience. Here's, here's the first one. Brown and Stanford have reversed decisions to cut athletics programs, recognizing such cuts work an undue hardship on students of color, investment performance over the past 12 months has strengthened endowments and past assumptions needed a reevaluation. Do you believe the University of Akron should also reevaluate? Uh, thank you for the question about reevaluating the athletic program. In fact, we have been reevaluating it. We have um, a group of alumni, faculty, and staff who have just uh, submitted the draft report, the Athletic Review Working Group, asking some of those same questions and developing a, a, a sharper value proposition for our ZIPS athletic program. Uh, I am uh, um, of the opinion, the strong opinion, that this program is of great value to us, and uh, I believe the board is of that opinion as well. Uh, but we are looking for ways to move forward to make it a much uh, bigger part of the university. Thank you. 
Another question uh, reference online learning. What did student feedback about the online learning process this past year? What, what kinds of comments did you get from the students? So students, by and large, um, uh, would prefer to have either a hybrid environment or a face-to-face -face environment. That was clear. Um, I will say, as an aside, there are a set of students who actually do pretty well in the hybrid environment. And uh, one of the important uh, aspects of our program going forward will to be to maintain that opportunity for them. And remember, the University of Akron, prior to COVID, uh, delivered quite a few, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 percent of our courses online anyway. Um, technology is, was a big complaint. Uh, a lot of our students did not have access to um, the right kind of technology. Um, and there are also, uh, there are also uh, challenges with um, just the, the way, the format, the size of classes, the, uh, the way you ask questions and so forth. The very, uh, for most people, very unfamiliar format. We got a lot better at it. And I, I think one thing people in, in the community need to know that when these universities changed over to, uh, to an online format, it seemed seamless, but it really was not. <laughs> and uh, uh, there, um, uh, there were a lot of challenges, both technologically and pedagogically with that, that we worked out through the COVID. All right, thank you. Another question reference uh COVID vaccines. What are your thoughts on requiring COVID vaccines among faculty, staff, and students? Is the university looking at requiring that of all coming onto the campus? So I, uh, I think we see that more as a, um, uh, a state decision, and you'll see lots of states moving in that direction. Uh, I think uh, most of us, at least I would prefer to require vaccines in some way. Whether that's possible or not is another question. Uh, I think we do have to figure out how we know who's vaccinated. Uh, and we, we're working really hard on that. In fact, we um, have had series of meetings this week, both at the state level and at the university level on how to do that. I would expect the universities in the state to move together in that regard. All right. Um, here's a fun one for you, Dr. Miller. A fun question? A fun, a fun <laughs> one, uh, kind of a statement and a, and a question from <laughs> an anonymous person. First off, we are grateful you and Georgia love our city. We are so grateful. What has been the most memorable part of your move to Akron and almost immediate transition to the isolated, you know, the isolation of being in a pandemic as a newly appointed president? Well, we, uh, uh, I think most of you know we've, this is our third presidency, and we were both uh, delighted at the introduction we got to the community in the five months before we had to close the university down. It was phenomenal, and we felt incredibly welcomed, and we were well on our way to learning important things like where all the good restaurants and so forth are. Um, but this fall, I, I think we both uh, believe that uh, we've got to step back and sort of do that again. We've got to uh, reintroduce ourselves, and we're really looking forward to that. We uh, are planning to do that. And uh, having had the experience uh, back in October of uh, 2019, I know we have a lot of fun to look forward to. Great. Um, here's some questions kind of along the same lines of thinking. You talked a little bit about strengthening the connections between the university and local, local and uh, area businesses. What specific opportunities are you looking at to strengthen those connections? Right. Some of them um, are already in place. Uh, uh, you know, we're working very closely with the chamber in our in polymer science to um, understand and leverage the uh, cluster polymer science businesses in this area, and. Uh, and, and drive some um, some processes to them, uh, toward them for testing and so forth, and that's got a lot of potential. Um, we, of course, have had long associations with the health associate uh, with the health uh, uh, enterprise around here. We're very closely aligned with the Akron Public Schools. This is very important to us, um, and uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, most of our programs 
most of our research programs at the university are uh, conduct what we call research with meaning, that is uh, research that has some application. And we see that throughout the university. It's very exciting, really. Uh, it's hard to talk about this in a talk like this, but if you have a chance like I do to look at what faculty and staff, uh, faculty in the research areas in particular were doing during the last 15 months, uh, when they were supposedly in isolation, they were working. <laughs> they were conducting research <laughs> and publishing papers and uh, getting grants. And uh, it, uh, it's uh, a great testament to the quality of our faculty coming out of COVID. All right, another question. The new vision for the University of Akron leaning on the arts is innovative and exciting. How will you help partners understand the deep importance and economic impact of the arts that, that is, uh, it, I'm not sure it's going to be as hard as uh, the questioner thinks. Uh, one of the things that drove us to this uh, particular initiative and um, to add to the many other initiatives that we have is that there is already a pretty strong appreciation in this community mm -hmm. about how the arts drive economic development, downtown development, and so forth. You can see that in the civic commons activities which very, and, and others. Um, I think that uh, it, it, if you look at national studies, and we've looked at a lot of them, particularly in legacy cities, upper Midwestern cities and others, um, leading with the arts is often the best way to start getting um, interest in uh, people moving downtown, living downtown, working downtown. Uh, plus, uh, I'll just be a little selfish and say that we have uh, our arts, uh, uh, visual performing arts, music, literature programs are some of the strongest I've ever seen. They're, they're fantastic programs. Um, we believe this can drive enrollment. Enrollment's very important to us as well. So we have, uh, we have our own interest in mind, of course. Uh, but really, for us to thrive, downtown Akron and our campus need to be indistinguishable. We need to, we need to move back and forth. That's what we are. We're an urban university right in downtown Akron. So. All right. Thank you. And uh, this looks like a, a last question. It's two-pronged. Um, how can alumni help with keeping the university a viable institution in downtown Akron? And uh, the writer says, former Zips can be powerful ambassadors for the university, and they're looking at your vision as to how they can help. In addition, what can the public do to assist the university in all its efforts? The alumni, the uh, somewhere near 180,000 alumni uh, that we have for the University of Akron, the most powerful uh, collective force we have. And um, we are working very, very hard um, uh, to mobilize them. And so the answer to their question is they can help us in just about every way they can imagine, and we're going to be asking. <laughs> All right. uh, so Thank the you. community is the same way. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Miller. You're quite welcome. My pleasure. Dr. Miller, thank you so much for being with us today. It was such a pleasure. Thank On you. behalf of the Akron Roundtable, I'd like to present to you this contemplative sun. This work of art was designed exclusively for our roundtable by local artist Don Drum. Again, thank you again. You're quite welcome. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining us today. Please uh, join us next month on June 27th when we host Rachel Cargill. She's a public academic writer and philanthropic innovator. Her topic will be literature as a gateway to understanding. Again, thank you and have a wonderful day.